17-year-old Richard Casso was accused of murdering another 17-year-old, Gary Lowers, in what police called a sacrificial killing. In the dead of night, June 19th, 1984, a small town was forever scarred by an unspeakable evil. Ricky Casso, a teenager consumed by unholy darkness, unleashed a horror beyond comprehension. It was late June 1984 in this small town of Northport, New York, where one event would turn this quiet village into a center for national attention. Butchering his friend Gary Lowers in a satanic ritual that defied the very fabric of humanity. As the darkness closed in, Casso's twisted mind reveled in the terror he had unleashed, believing himself to be the master of his twisted destiny. Unfortunately, Ricky Casso is not an isolated case. Join us as we take a look at some of the most evil kids in the world. Jasmine Richardson. Few cases in criminal history are as shocking as Jasmine Richardson's, the 12-year-old Canadian girl who masterminded the brutal murder of her entire family. On April 23, 2006, Jasmine and her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Steinke, ended the life of her parents, Mark and Deborah, and her brother, Tyler, in cold blood. The horrific scene was stumbled upon by a neighbor who glanced through the window, witnessing the unimaginable. The bodies of Mark, Deborah, and Tyler Richardson lay lifeless, victims of a brutal slaughter. Initially, authorities suspected Jasmine had fallen prey to a kidnapper, but as the investigation unfolded, the truth was revealed. The 12-year-old was not a victim, but a prime suspect. Evidence at the crime scene pointed to Jasmine's involvement, and she was apprehended alongside her boyfriend, Steinke, a hundred miles away from the scene. Jasmine's parents had grown concerned about her relationship with Steinke, who shared her fascination with the dark and occult. They had forbidden her from seeing him, but the couple's determination to be together only strengthened. In a haunting message, Jasmine revealed her deadly intentions. I have this plan, and it begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. During the trial, a troubling story emerged involving teenage rebellion and the disturbing influence of Steinke, who claimed to be a 300-year-old werewolf. Jasmine was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder and given the maximum sentence of 10 years in prison under Canada's youth criminal justice system. Steinke, on the other hand, received three concurrent life sentences. Tragically, Jasmine's case is not an isolated incident. Other children have made the unthinkable decision to take the lives of their loved ones. Mason Sisk. 14-year-old Mason Sisk made the unthinkable decision to end the life of his entire family in their Elkmont, Alabama home on September 2, 2019. His reason? According to him, he was fed up with their constant arguing. Mason's actions that day resulted in widespread devastation and profound grief. He shot and unalived his parents, John and Mary, and his three siblings, Kane, Rory, and Coulson. The crime was so heinous that the judge, Chad Wise, described it as disturbing and draped in unmitigated evil. As the case went to trial, Mason's guilt was clear. He was found guilty of four counts of capital murder, and the jury didn't hesitate, delivering a verdict in under two hours. Mason's fate was sealed. He would spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. But what drove Mason to commit such a horrific act? According to those who knew him, Mason had a history of anger issues and had even threatened his family before. In an audio recording, Mason confessed to the crime, citing his frustration with his family's arguments. The tragedy of this case is compounded by the fact that Mason's actions were not just a spontaneous outburst, but a calculated and premeditated attack. He had even attempted to harm his stepmother before, deliberately mixing peanut butter into her coffee, despite knowing she had a severe allergy. Following the crime, family members and loved ones struggled with unimaginable grief. Mason's stepmother, who had survived his previous attempt on her life, tragically succumbed to cardiac arrest upon hearing about the murders. Her brother, Douglas Prater, remembered the joy and gifts they had shared, now replaced with sorrow and caskets. However, there was this other kid who was basically at his wit's end and did the unthinkable. He ended up killing his family over a cassette tape. Ricky Casso. 
Richard Allen, also known as Ricky Casso or the Acid King, gained notoriety for committing a brutal murder in Northport, New York on June 19, 1984. He killed his 17-year-old friend Gary Lowers in the secluded Aztecia Woods. Also present during the crime were two other teenagers, Jimmy Troiano and Albert Quinones. The murder garnered widespread attention across New York City and the nation due to the alleged torture inflicted on Lowers and the perceived occult elements surrounding the crime. It occurred during the Satanic Panic Era, a time marked by public anxiety over supposed satanic and occult influences in heavy metal music and role-playing games. At the time of his arrest, Casso was clad in an Australian rock band t-shirt and expressed admiration for bands like Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, and Ozzy Osbourne. Born into a family where his father was a local high school history teacher and football coach at Cold Spring Harbor High School, Casso experienced a turbulent upbringing. Frequently ejected from his home as a teenager, he resorted to sleeping in suburban Northport's local woods, cars, garages, and occasionally in the homes of friends. His lifestyle was intertwined with drug use, including marijuana, hashish, and what he believed were purple microdots of mescaline, though they were likely low-grade lysergic acid diethylamide. While primarily using drugs for himself, he occasionally engaged in dealing within Northport. Casso was familiar with a loosely knit group of friends who sold marijuana and dubbed themselves the Knights of the Black Circle. Following Casso's murder of Lowers, several newspapers and TV reporters erroneously labeled the Knights as a satanic cult. Casso purportedly engaged in occult rituals primarily in Northport and even observed Walpurgis Night at the infamous Amityville Horror House in 1984. He openly discussed his fascination with Anton LaVey's book, The Satanic Bible, among friends. Before the murder, Casso had a troubling incident. He was arrested for desecrating a colonial-era grave at a local cemetery. Shortly afterward, he contracted pneumonia and was admitted to Long Island Jewish Hospital for treatment. While there, his parents sought to have him admitted for involuntary psychiatric care. However, psychiatrists diagnosed Casso with antisocial behavior, ruling out psychosis, and determining that he posed no immediate danger to others. Once he recovered from pneumonia, Casso was discharged from the hospital. In the fateful summer of 1984, a bitter feud between Casso and Lowers had been simmering for months. It all began when Lowers made the grave mistake of stealing 10 bags of fencyclidine from Casso's jacket at a party taking advantage of Casso's vulnerable state after he had passed out. The tension between them was palpable, and their conflict was far from over. Casso confronted Lowers soon after, and Lowers hastily returned five of the stolen bags, promising to repay Casso $50 for the remaining five. However, this attempt at reconciliation was short-lived, as Casso's anger and resentment continued to grow unchecked. He brutally assaulted Lowers on four separate occasions, leaving behind a trail of violence and hostility. On the tragic night of June 19, 1984, Casso ominously invited Lowers to join Troiano and Quinones for a night of drug-fueled revelry in the woods. The group consumed what they believed to be mescaline, but was actually lysergic acid diethylamide and smoked bags laced with fencyclidine. As the night progressed, the situation spiraled into chaos, climaxing with a vicious attack by Casso on Lowers. The brutality of the assault was shocking, with Lowers stabbed between 17 and 36 times, his eyeballs possibly gouged out. Casso's twisted demands for Lowers to proclaim his love for Satan were met with a defiant declaration of love for his mother, a final act of courage in the face of unimaginable horror. In the aftermath, Casso and Troiano callously covered Lauer's lifeless body with leaves and branches, leaving him to be discovered in the woods. The true date of the murder, June 19, 1984, was initially misreported, but the details of that fateful night haunted the community. Following the murder, Casso boasted about the killing to acquaintances, alleging that Satan had appeared to him in the form of a black crow, whose cawing he interpreted as approval of the gruesome act. 
In a macabre display, Caso brought skeptical peers to witness Lauer's body before he and Troiano returned to the woods to hastily bury the remains in a shallow grave. However, it took two weeks for the murder to come to light when an anonymous tip led police to discover Lauer's decomposed and mutilated body in Aztequia Woods on July 4, 1984. The subsequent investigation resulted in Caso and Troiano's arrest the following day. On July 7, 1984, Caso tragically took his own life by hanging in his jail cell. In the legal aftermath, Troiano initially confessed to his involvement, but later retracted his statements. Quinones, whose testimony was clouded by drug use at the time of the murder, initially claimed Troiano assisted Caso, but later recanted this during Troiano's trial. Quinones's credibility was questioned due to his altered state during the crime, leading to Troiano's acquittal of second-degree murder on April 1985, following a jury trial. David Brom. On October 3, 1989, David received a grim 18th birthday present from a jury in Rochester, Minnesota. Guilty verdicts on four counts of first-degree murder. He brutally ended the lives of his father, mother, and two siblings with an ax, delivering a total of 56 blows. A week later, the jury rejected his insanity plea and sentenced him to three consecutive life terms in prison, plus an additional concurrent term. The judge presiding over the case was deeply affected by the brutality of the crimes and the tragic waste of David's life. The horror was so overwhelming that she broke down in tears in her chambers. What drove David to commit such a heinous act? Medical records and testimonies revealed that he was battling severe depression at the time of the murders. David was a sophomore at a Catholic prep school where he had previously attempted suicide twice, the last attempt just months before the killings. Friends also testified that David had been discussing his intent to kill his family for six months leading up to the tragedy. On February 18, 1988, in a serene suburban residence in Cascade Township, police uncovered the bodies of Bernard Bram, his wife, Pet, and their children, Diane and Rick. All were found in their pajamas, brutally murdered in the early morning hours. The weapon, a bloodied ax, was abandoned in the basement. David Bram, the sole survivor of the family, had fled the scene. Another brother residing elsewhere was cleared of any suspicion after his alibi was verified. Police quickly found David's palm print on the murder weapon and apprehended him the following day as he made a call from a payphone at a post office. He confessed to the murders, explaining that he had argued with his father over a cassette tape he wanted to listen to. The tape featured songs with controversial themes like religion and media manipulation, which David's devout Catholic father disapproved of and attempted to limit his son's access to. David Bram now resides in the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Stillwater, where he will remain until he is eligible to apply for parole at the age of 70. Kosta Kekmanovic. In the pre-dawn hours of May 3, 2023, the tranquility of Belgrade, Serbia was shattered by an unthinkable tragedy. What started as an ordinary school day at a well-regarded institution quickly descended into chaos and horror. At just 13 years old, Kosta Kekmanovic forever altered the lives of many when he carried out a meticulously planned shooting spree that claimed the lives of eight students and a security guard. Kosta, a seemingly unremarkable boy from a prominent Belgrade family, arrived at school that morning with a determination hidden beneath his calm demeanor. Armed with pistols legally owned by his father, Kosta first targeted the school's security guard and two unsuspecting female students in the hallway. He then systematically advanced towards his own classroom, where he opened fire indiscriminately, resulting in the fatalities of seven more students and injuries to several others. The gravity of the situation became evident when Costa himself called the authorities, calmly confessing to the heinous act he had just committed. Despite his age, which shielded him from criminal charges under Serbian law, Costa was swiftly apprehended and placed under psychiatric care at a hospital in Belgrade. In the weeks leading up to the incident, he had meticulously planned the attack. Carefully choosing his targets and receiving firearm instruction from his father, a well-regarded radiologist. After what happened, Costa's parents faced legal trouble. 
His dad was accused of mishandling guns and letting his son have access to them too early, which was seen as really wrong. His mom, not realizing what Costa was planning, ended up charged with neglect for missing the signs of his troubling thoughts as they got worse. As the community struggled to cope with the tragedy, Costa's motivations came to light through his testimony. Influenced by a popular tactical shooter game and a documentary on mass violence, he had become ensnared in a twisted fantasy of power and influence. In a haunting revelation, he expressed regret for his actions, wishing he could undo what had occurred. Michael Hernandez When Hernandez was just 14, he became enthralled by the dark world of serial killers. Instead of indulging in typical teenage pursuits like video games and socializing, he spent hours glued to his screen, researching the gruesome crimes of infamous murderers. His fascination with these killers soon morphed into a sinister desire to emulate them. Hernandez's obsession took a turn when he decided to follow in the footsteps of his idols. He began plotting his killing spree, starting with his classmates at South Dade Middle School in Palmetto Bay, Florida. On February 3, 2004, he armed himself with a knife, gloves, and an oversized jacket, ready to unleash his deadly plan. His first intended victim was Andre Martin, but Martin's intuition saved his life when he declined Hernandez's invitation to the bathroom. Unfortunately, tragedy struck when Hernandez redirected his focus to his friend Jamie Goff, who trusted him and followed him into the bathroom. In a heartbreaking turn of events, Hernandez's intentions became clear as he brutally attacked Jamie, inflicting 42 stab wounds and slashing his throat. The horrific crime was soon discovered and Hernandez was apprehended. As investigators looked into Hernandez's case, they uncovered a journal that exposed his sinister plans. The pages revealed a shocking kill list, naming his own sister as a potential victim. Alongside others, he had deemed deserving of death. The journal also detailed a meticulously planned murder kit, complete with a shopping list of weapons and tools to carry out his gruesome acts. Despite his attempt to plead insanity, the court saw through Hernandez's facade, and he was sentenced to life in prison in 2008. Behind bars, Hernandez's dark journey continued, marked by a descent into morbid obesity and a plethora of health issues. On April 29th, 2021, Hernandez's life of violence and darkness came to an end. He died in prison at the age of 31, succumbing to cardiac dysrhythmia, a condition exacerbated by his extreme weight gain. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. In a bustling city courthouse, amidst the hum of whispered conversations and the shuffle of papers, sat a small figure that seemed out of place, a seven-year-old boy named Tommy his tiny wrists shackled to the chair and body tied with chains. Tommy, accused of a crime that defied his innocence, was at the center of a case that had captured national attention. He was charged with breaking into a toy store and stealing a handful of action figures, valued at no more than a few dollars. The prosecutor, a sharp-suited woman named Miss Harris, argued vehemently that Tommy had knowingly committed theft citing security footage that showed him entering the store after hours. She painted a picture of deliberate wrongdoing, ignoring the fact that Tommy had been seen in tears earlier that day, carrying a worn-out stuffed bear he had cherished since infancy. On the defense side, Tommy's attorney, Mr. Ramirez, stood tall with a calm demeanor that contrasted sharply with the tension in the room. He argued passionately that Tommy, at seven years old, could not fully grasp the consequences of his actions. He recounted how Tommy's family had fallen on hard times, struggling to make ends meet after his father lost his job, leaving Tommy yearning for toys he couldn't afford. As the trial progressed, Tommy sat quietly, his eyes wide as he tried to make sense of the adults' discussions. His parents, sitting in the back row with tear-filled eyes, could only watch helplessly as their son faced judgment beyond his years. Amidst this scene, Tommy was a stark contrast to the portrayal of the most evil kid in the world. Now, as Judge Thompson prepared to deliver his verdict, the courtroom held its collective breath. The judge's gaze softened briefly as he addressed Tommy, acknowledging the child's presence amidst the sea of legal complexities. He began by stating that what Tommy had done was wrong, 
but expressed belief that Tommy hadn't fully understood. The judge asked Tommy if he wanted those toys, to which Tommy nodded hesitantly, his lower lip trembling. Then the judge inquired if Tommy knew that taking things without asking was not right, to which Tommy nodded again, his eyes welling up with tears. The judge continued in a thoughtful tone, saying he believed Tommy had learned his lesson and emphasizing the need to ensure Tommy understood. He asked Tommy to promise not to take things that didn't belong to him again, and Tommy nodded vigorously, clutching his teddy bear tightly to his chest. Turning to the courtroom, Judge Thompson declared that in light of Tommy's age and circumstances, he believed probation and community service would be sufficient. The tension in the room eased as Tommy's parents hugged each other in relief. Mr. Ramirez placed a comforting hand on Tommy's shoulder and the courtroom buzzed with subdued conversation. As Tommy left the courtroom, his small hand held firmly by his mother's. One lingering question hung in the air. How should we navigate the delicate balance between justice and compassion, especially when kids are at the center? What are your opinions on Tommy's situation? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. Mitchell Johnson and Andre Golden. On March 24, 1998, a meticulously planned and devastating attack unfolded at Westside Middle School in Arkansas, orchestrated by two young boys aged 13 and 11. Mitchell Johnson and Andrew Golden, despite their differences in age, grades, and personalities, shared a hidden penchant for violence that culminated in tragedy. Mitchell Johnson, grappling with a troubled family life and a history of aggressive behavior, harbored dark ambitions that included joining a gang and had even faced charges of misconduct. On the other hand, Andrew Golden appeared to be a model student outwardly, known for his politeness and fondness for marksmanship. However, Beneath this facade, Andrew Golden concealed a disturbing tendency for cruelty, evidenced by his ruthless treatment of animals. Bonding over their shared desire to wreak havoc, the boys stole weapons and ammunition from Golden's grandfather, loading them into Johnson's mother's van, along with camping supplies. On the day of the attack, they feigned missing their bus, instead parking in the woods behind the school. When the fire alarm was pulled, Chaos erupted as they opened fire indiscriminately on teachers and students, shouting misleading statements to sow confusion and maximize their carnage. The shooting lasted a harrowing 10 minutes, claiming the lives of four students and one brave teacher, Shannon Wright, who sacrificed herself to shield a sixth grader from the gunfire. 10 others were wounded before the boys, out of ammunition, attempted to flee in the van, only to be apprehended by police. Despite the severity of their actions, Johnson and Golden, due to their young age, faced the juvenile justice system rather than adult courts. They were found guilty of several counts of murder and assault, which led to them being sentenced to confinement until they reached 21 years old, the maximum allowed by Arkansas law. Their paths after release diverged tragically. Johnson, despite multiple incarcerations and opportunities for rehabilitation, continued to be drawn to crime, repeatedly landing back in prison for offenses ranging from drug possession to theft. Golden, who renamed himself Drew Douglas Grant after his release, sought a quieter life but could not escape his past. His attempt to obtain a concealed weapons permit under a new identity was denied, and he remained under scrutiny until he died in a car accident in 2019. Daniel Bartlam, a tranquil Nottingham neighborhood was thrust into chaos on the evening of April 25, 2011, when flames erupted from a suburban home. Firefighters raced to the scene and battled ferociously to douse the blaze. Amidst the smoke and charred remnants, they made a harrowing discovery, the lifeless body of Jacqueline Bartlam, a 47-year-old mother of two. Her son, Daniel, managed to escape the raging fire with his younger brother and their faithful dog. Initially, Daniel told authorities that an intruder had assaulted his mother and started the fire. However, as investigators probed deeper into the incident, discrepancies in his account started to surface. The autopsy results revealed a stunning truth, debunking the initial assumption that Jacqueline's death was an accidental casualty of the fire. Instead, the examination exposed a horrific reality. She had suffered a violent death, brutally bludgeoned with a hammer, 
leaving her body unrecognizable due to severe injuries. Investigators came to understand that the fire was not a random incident, but a purposeful effort to destroy evidence and mask the atrocious crime. Under intense police scrutiny, Daniel persisted with his fabricated account of an intruder, but his younger brother's conflicting statements only heightened suspicions. In the end, confronted with overwhelming evidence, Daniel's mask fell away, and he admitted to a crime that reverberated across the nation. He detailed what happened. Daniel crept into his mother's bedroom with hammers, delivering fatal blows, then coldly starting a fire to cover his tracks. He carefully cleaned and hid the murder weapon, placing another hammer by a window to confuse investigators. He briefly went back into the burning house, claiming to rescue their pet and portraying himself as a hero, all the while hiding his brutal crime. Initially claiming his mother had insulted him, Daniel's true motive soon emerged. He had meticulously planned the murder for weeks, inspired by a television drama that blurred his grasp on reality. His fascination with violent narratives, especially from popular soap operas like Coronation Street, had led him to craft a macabre imitation of a fictional storyline. Revelations of Daniel's troubled mental state, including reports of disturbing fantasies and voices urging violence, painted a portrait. Despite these red flags, experts had failed to predict the danger he posed, allowing a tragic sequence of events to unfold. In February 2012, Daniel faced trial for his mother's murder, initially pleading guilty to manslaughter under a claim of loss of control. However, the prosecution made a compelling case for premeditation, highlighting Daniel's meticulous planning and disturbing online activities. Judge Julian Fox, handing down a life sentence with a minimum term of 16 years, condemned the crime as grotesque and senseless. He pointed to Daniel's pursuit of what he called the perfect murder. Cindy Collier and Shirley Wolf, a duo of teenage girls who coldly regarded the brutal stabbing of an elderly woman as an enjoyable and celebratory act have been convicted of first-degree murder and burglary. Their disturbing remarks underscored the callous nature of their crime, which resulted in the loss of an 85-year-old life. 14-year-old Shirley Wolf and 15-year-old Cindy Collier stood expressionless as they were swiftly convicted in Placer County Juvenile Court. Judge J. Richard Cousins swiftly delivered the verdict in 15 minutes during a solemn and efficient court session. The trial revealed disturbing details about the June 14, 1983 murder of Anna Brackett, a resident of Auburn. She suffered a brutal attack, being stabbed 28 times with both a paring knife and a butcher knife in her own home. The recorded confessions of the girls revealed their meticulous planning, detailing their motive to steal Mrs. Brackett's car and travel to Placerville. Shirley was reported to have described the murder callously, referring to it as her job. Meanwhile, Cindy was said to have revealed their sinister motive, stating that they had wanted to kill someone simply for fun, as it had seemed enjoyable to them. Cindy's troubled past and feelings of resentment towards Mrs. Brackett's comfortable life were also exposed. During the sentencing proceedings, Shirley's legal team argued that her actions were motivated by a compulsive thrill-killing mindset rooted in mental instability, allegedly exacerbated by previous claims of sexual abuse by her father. On August 12, the court evaluated her mental competency alongside Cindy's sentencing. The potential outcomes ranged from a maximum 10-year sentence at the California Youth Authority to the possibility of release in six years. Alternatively, depending on the court's assessment of her mental state, Shirley could be sentenced to treatment in a mental health facility. Kyle Allwood. In the United States, a tragic and heart-wrenching incident unfolded involving a nine-year-old boy named Kyle Allwood, who faced serious charges after allegedly starting a fire that claimed the lives of five family members in their Illinois mobile home. The tragic fire claimed the lives of Kyle's one-year-old half-sister, Ariel, two-year-old half-brother, Demion, his two-year-old cousin, Rose, stepfather, Jason Wall, and grandmother, Catherine Murray. Following the fire in April 2019, Kyle appeared in court where he was charged with five counts of first-degree murder, along with multiple arson charges. Due to his young age, Kyle, barely visible above the back of his chair with his feet barely touching the ground, 
could not be held in custody, as reported by news. During the court proceedings, it was noted that Kyle had to have legal terms, such as alleged and arson, explained to him. Overcome with emotion, he left the courtroom in tears, accompanied by his grandfather. The potential legal ramifications for Kyle are significant yet complex. At present, he faces the possibility of a minimum of five years of probation until the age of 21. If he remains offense-free by the age of 13, he may avoid further legal consequences such as imprisonment. Additionally, it is anticipated that Kyle will undergo extensive therapy and mental health evaluations as part of his rehabilitation process. Kyle's mother, Katie Allwood, who survived the fire along with him, has staunchly defended her son in the face of public scrutiny. In an interview, she expressed deep forgiveness and empathy for Kyle, emphasizing that he is not a monster, but a child who made a tragic mistake. Katie revealed that Kyle had recently been diagnosed with schizophrenia, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and bipolar disorder, highlighting his mental health challenges. Recalling the tragic loss of her other children and partner in the fire, Katie remembered the heartbreaking moment when she realized she couldn't rescue them. She described standing by the window, apologizing to her children, and expressing her love as the flames consumed their home. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.